So it's not about hair. Hmm? It's not about hair. It's not about hair. What makes you Okay. Oh, yes. I wondered about that first. You can, you can stay in the camera. Ah. Okay. <coughs> I, I guess I'm very um, So, we take it uh, for granted, I think, that the ancient world, the sea which we have, was teeming with buildings, especially temples of glisteningly white marble. And it's Hard to realize now um, that ancient Rome, as you see it reconstructed in this model, famous model, uh, was the exception, not the rule, and that even the uh, Acropolis, um, this uh, you know, assembly of brilliant white pentelic marble buildings, uh, was actually an anomaly and one that would uh, change the trend um, of in, um, architectural materiality and antiquity. And of course, uh, temples were um, the reason we, we, the culprit for this optic are not only neoclassical buildings uh, like the Supreme Court, um, or in fact, most of Washington, D.C., um, but also the modernists who look back to an all-white ideal when they believe themselves to be purifying architecture of the accretions of history. Now, of course, temples were never completely white because color was added, but this tended to be restricted to the superstructure of the temple, uh, the entablature, the templum where you found all the sculpture, um, the part of the temple that the Greeks called the cosmos, actually, confusingly enough. Um, recent obsession with the polychromy of ancient sculpture and temples alike has obscured the more important question of why, the, of why Greek temples were white and why the Greeks built uh, in marble at all. Now, when the first temples began to appear in Greece toward the end of the 8th century BC, they were, of course, built of much humbler materials. They were built of wood and wattle and terracotta was added and uh, this seems to have been covered with all sorts of uh, quite uh, polychrome um, patterning. The 6th century instead, 6th century BC, instead saw an increasing shift towards cut stone and temples began to assume the shape that we recognize today. Now, um, the Greeks must have had I think some impetus from the limestone and sandstone uh, architecture of Egypt, particularly its temples, um, as they had no contact with any other stone architecture in the Mediterranean to speak of. But they preferred a rather more chauvinistic view of the origins of their architecture as being completely uh, indigenous um, when they later theorized that the stone temples they were building were modeled on primitive timber cabins themselves derived from the idea that early man had laced together the uh, branches of trees to, to make the first shelters. Um, and then the idea that these were then captured, these early buildings were uh, translated um, for posterity uh, in stone, into stone forms uh, in which their ornaments were fossils, so to speak, of the prior carpentry. And this, of course, is the Parthenon down here, but this one's the best example I know, actually. It's a building, it was the Oregon State Building, built at the 1915 San Francisco um, Fair, and then demolished at the end of it. Uh, and the Oregon Forestry Building, which was actually identical internally, if not externally, made it until 1968 when it uh, became the biggest bonfire in the history of Oregon. So um, about 580 BC, um, the new Greek temples were raised on what's called a, a crepidoma. And this is a, a stepped platform, uh, typically of three steps, sometimes more, 
uh, and generally of incrementally diminishing stages. And as these stages were normally too tall to ascend except by climbing, the crepidoma, the step platform here, um, obviously belonged to the world of representation rather than ergonomics. And in this sense, the closest affinity uh, that this, the, the base of a temple has is to the stepped altar, which was appearing, beginning to appear in Greece and on the Ionian as the Greek coast of Turkey, uh, roughly about the same time. Now, that's where I'd normally stop if it weren't for the fact that uh, excavations this year are at um, Das Gallio, which is uh, an islet off the island of Keros in the Cyclades, um, so again, in the Mediterranean, quite near to the Greek um, coast, mainland Greek coast, um, has not uncovered uh, uh, enough data to show that the, this entire islet here was um, made uh, into a sort of, sort of giant step pyramid by, uh, with, by terracing walls, um, built from a kind of gleaming white stone and several thousand tons of it as well. And this was done at some point in the mid-third millennium, somewhere between 2700 and 2300 uh, BC, um, so we're told at the moment, which is simply extraordinary because that means that this island is uh, possibly contemporary with the Step Pyramid of Caesar, a Saqqara in Egypt, which is the absolutely the earliest uh, monumental building in cut stone um, I'm aware of, um, and also ziggurats like this one shown on a, on a relief now in the um, Archaeological Museum um, in Pennsylvania. So it's sort of staggeringly um, early, but it shows that there was a transmission of these kind of step structures or imagination of them uh, much earlier than we think. Although it's not being shown that this is necessarily a religious structure, because we don't know about cults in Eugene at this stage. Anyway, the point of mentioning this is that the crepidoma of the classical temple miniaturizes, really, these sort of ziggurats and step structures uh, and raises up the earth to meet the sky in a plateau that sort of reimagined the mountain top as the basis for the temple. The stones still belong to the earth. But with this uplifting gesture, the temple metamorphosed into a supernatural object. It became a new Olympus. And to complete the transformation, the stones would have to transform themselves. And it was white marble that resonated more loudly than any other stone, because its sleek luminosity apparently materialized earthly substance as if it were sort of solid light. Now, why is that? Well, whiteness in the, the Greek mind was uh, associated with brightness. The word leukos in Greek, um, often translated as white, um, actually refers to luminosity. When Homer talks about the most brilliant light source he can think of, he says, as leukos, as the sun as uh, white as the sun. And marble, uh, of course, is a uh, limestone that's, uh, um, whose calcite is re recrystallized uh, under heat and pressure, and it means it can take a very sheer polish. Um, several marbles uh, have uh, various white marbles because their large crystals have various degrees of uh, allow for translucency, etc., etc., etc. Marble can shine. Um, it appears to trans uh, transmit light, uh, it radiates, and for these reasons, of course, the word uh, marble comes from the Greek marmaros, which comes from the Greek verb marmaren, to uh, radiate or shine. Now, um, the stone that was used to build that huge uh, step, or transform that island into a huge step structure, um, and the island I've shown you before is actually basically about there. Um, came from this place, Naxos, uh, where the quarries still today produce um, huge amounts of uh, white marble blocks. And 
Nazian marble is, as you can see down here, is a, a marble with uh, extremely um, large calcite crystals, but it's also micaceous, which means that when you look at it, it's as though there's a sort of dusting of glitter overlying its inherent glow. Now, not only that, Naxos also produced emery, the tough abrasive that made shaping and polishing marble first possible. And so it's no accident then that the um, earliest systematic sculpture in marble, um, which of course is world renowned as cycladic sculpture, actually begins uh, on Naxos and the islands around it, somewhere around 3000 BC. Um, nor that the first monumental Greek sculpture, the Kuros, and possibly the first Kore as well, um, begin to be carved here somewhere around 600 BC. And almost as soon as they started producing these types of figures, these monumental figures of striding nudes, clearly influenced by Egyptian sculpture, this was already well known um, in antiquity, they produced a created a massive statue of Apollo, 30 feet high, weighing 25 tons, which they boated over to the nearby island of Delos, which is one of the most important religious sanctuaries in the Mediterranean, where once erected, it dwarfed the, all the buildings around it. And this Apollo was in fact, and this is quite important, this Apollo was not only the largest standing uh, statue in the Greek world, it was not only the largest artifact in marble anywhere at all, um, but it was the largest monolithic structure of any kind that the Greeks had so far erected. And in fact, you'd have to go to Egypt and find statues of Ramesses, something like that, to find really anything similar. So, what it did was point the way, a statue pointed the way to entire buildings that could be built not from just any old stone, but the most refined of all, uh, which was statue marble, white statue marble, and buildings that could be built at a superhuman scale. Now, the building next to it, uh, which was quite probably the first monumental temple built to this god, Apollo, on the island was um, almost immediately uh, rebuilt. And in an absolutely extraordinary, oh sorry, I just wanted to show you, this is another statue uh, on Naxos, another monolithic statue that never made it out of the quarry. And it's all very well talking about something being 30 feet high and weighing 25 tons, but when you see a man uh, sitting uh, on it, you, you get some idea of the real scale of these things. Anyway, as I was saying, uh, almost immediately they reconstruct the building next to the statue, because the statue had upped the ante for the architecture, um, and in a kind of amazing uh, innovation, uh, they decide to roof over this uh, temple with marble tiles, which is ca rather counterintuitive sort of thing to do, because they're incredibly heavy. And these tiles were sawn so thin that they could exploit the translucency of the marble to illumine the cult room within. And what you've really got to do is kind of imagine being in this cult room at dawn with the sort of the, the sun rising, the dawn approaching, the room gradually uh, and being infused with the illumination of the creeping sun and standing there. A lot of religious ritual did take place at dawn and being there in this room and the next thing you would expect would be to Apollo, for Apollo himself to kick in the door. Um, now, in the same era that the Naxians rebuilt this temple, they began back home to build uh, temples completely uh, of white marble. And it's the first time it's done. White marble architecture really begins as an idiom of these on uh, Naxos and Paris and the Cyclades just because there's such an abundance of, of white marble there. Um, and then it's an idea that they export. And in one particular 
uh, instance, this is the temple of Demeter, it's thought not only was the whole temple built of uh, walls built block on block of white marble, not only was the roof uh, of marble tiles, but the rafters were and the curtains were. There wasn't any part of it that wasn't built from white marble. So it must have seemed as if the temple was a creation of light uh, itself. And within it, there would have been a Chris Elephantine cult statue. That is a cult statue made from ivory and gold. And this thing in this kind of you know, soup of light right, would have appeared to emerge from it uh, like a sort of glistening bather from a tub. Now, Naxos and Paros um, provided statue after statue to the Greek mainland but that's not, and also the Greek colonies in Sicily and southern Italy. Um, but that's not the only thing they provided. Uh, they would send over literally body parts um, in these fine white marbles to be inserted into the local calcareous stone. This is Sicily. So that when you looked at the goddess Hera, to whom the temple was dedicated, and you looked at her brilliant white skin, you didn't think, femininity, actually. You thought this is the flesh of the gods. This is the flesh of people who eat, um, eat uh, ambrosia and drink nectar. You knew this was divine stuff. And interestingly enough, the extremities of the temple were also built from these very fine white marbles, uh, and the roof tiles in particular. Um, and You have to ask yourself why. Now, it's been suggested um, that, that, that these things are simply, sorry, simply, oh, pardon me, are simply luxury uh, materials. Okay. Um, the local, there, but there was no marble on Sicily. There were no marble quarries, in fact, anywhere in Italy that were open. There was only this kind of local, very nice to our eyes, um, honey-coloured um, poured stone. So what they would do is they would make a plaster from marble dust right, and coat the thing completely in it. And what's normally said about this is, oh, well, it's an attempt to kind of upgrade the local stone to have something that's sort of, you know, of a finer material and so on. But these are people who've never seen white marble. So this was actually as alien as building the thing out of blocks of ice. And I use that, you can think of it as an ice palace. It would have been that outlandish for them. And I use the metaphor of ice because ice crystal, rock crystal, was believed to be uh, like a uh, form of uh, super frozen ice, like a, a natural material. Now, um, there's been a lot of debate about whether these marble roofs um, that ca uh, capped Greek temples were actually used as light diffusers in the same way that they were um, on those early archaic temples on Naxos. And I have to believe they were, because it seems to me extraordinary that they would continue building uh, marble roofs and have given up the most wondrous characteristic of the material, which was that it could naturally illuminate the building. Uh, and the two most famous examples of this, this has to be true, I think. One is the Parthenon uh, in Athens, as you see it reconstructed here, in Nashville, in reinforced concrete, um, with the, the, two, the temple, the largest, tallest uh, statue, Chris Elephantine statue in ivory and gold uh, in the Greek world, and also the temple of Zeus, very famous temple of Zeus um, at Olympia, with an equally large statue in the same materials this time, suits seated. And if you want to imagine what these were like, the effect was like, Gosh, sorry, it's my ineptitude for this. Um, you can do no better, really, than go to the Lincoln Memorial uh, in D.C. And this is an unwitting reconstruction. When this was built, um, they had no reason to believe uh, that Greek temples were actually roofed over in this way. And the Lincoln Memorial, I'm sure all of that you have been there will know that this really comes alive at night, you know, when they switch on the electric bulbs. So in the Greek case, um, it would have been the bulbs of the sun. 
And the story doesn't finish here with these uh, a, um, sim simple ley lights in marble, because in both these temples, the floor in front was excavated by the sculptor. So in the temple of Zeus at Olympia, there was a pool of black stone covered with olive oil. Right? And in the temple of the, uh, the Parthenon, instead there was a pool of water over white marble. So these things were like giant reflecting mirrors. And you walked into a, a, a material, into a temple, which was lit from above, um, reflected from below, into a kind of topsy-turvy world, where moving through this plasma of light was like wading through the temple. Now I've gone on long enough, I will finish simply by telling you about this. Um, the white, white marble, therefore, as the material of light, um, becomes a sort of lingua franca of the Greek world after uh, they go to the expense of building most of the Acropolis from local white marble, and then throughout the Roman Empire. And uh, in Delphi, uh, before this happens, the, when they come to rebuilding the temple of Apollo there, um, it's, it's, they're going to use the normal materials, the local stone and so on, but a very wealthy member of an Athenian family turns up and he says, well, I'll pay for it, and decides to build the entire front facade of the temple out of Parian marble. And this is the first time anybody's thought, really, of building a uh, temple or facade, or building facade on this scale from statue marble. And in the middle of this, in the middle of the facade there, this facade faces east, so it really comes alive with the rays of the dawn sun. You see Apollo in his chariot, surround, surrounded by his cortege, having arrived here from Delos, the island where the Colossus was built, I was telling you before, and bringing his radiance with him. Now, unfortunately, this thing goes up in smoke as well, and when they rebuild this temple, they don't have the money to rebuild it in white marble again. So they build it in the local stone, they use the plaster technique that you've seen used in Sicily, and it's just as much a mirage of light uh, as it is before. And to acknowledge this, and this is the sort of the proof of the pudding, basically, the Rhodians build this huge um, podium in front of the temple with the god Helios, so the sun, and, and Apollo and Helios are originally separate divinities, but, but at this stage they're beginning to be identified with themselves because Apollo is, is called Phoebos Apollo, the brilliant, the, uh, um, yes, the god of, he's seen as a god of light. And you have Helios, the sun god here, uh, in a chariot, a gilded chariot, um, racing the, the sun across the sky with the horses rearing, which shows you that it's the sun rising and pointed directly at the statue of Apollo in the middle of the temple pediment. And what this is doing is giving shape uh, and form to an idea that was previously present in the material and its luminosity. Thanks.